I have God, I have so many questions, but I'll try to break it down real quick here. When I was when I was younger, I was about twenty. I uh, I was driving down the street. I was driving really fast. I was speeding down the street, and I ha- I heard a voice say, uh, "Slow down! You're gonna you're gonna hit someone." So I was like, it kind of scared me. So I, I stopped. Like I, I slowed down, and as I stopped, as I slowed down, a car passed me, and this lady hit this little boy crossing the street, and so. As I as I got up to the the scene of the accident, um, the little boy was underneath the car, and so I got out of my car and everything like started moving in slow motion. And you know, you hear about mm-hmm. adrenaline and this and this and that, but I just remember it so vividly that it was like just really slow, really really slow. So this this guy that was there, he's like, "You need to lift up the car." <laughs> I'm just like, "Okay, I'll lift up the car." You know? So as I I reached down, I lifted up the car. Like it was so light. I've I've never. It was it was just weird because I could just pick it up, like not even thinking about it. And as I as I as he pulled out the little boy, I dropped the car. And as I dropped the car, everything came back into like fast motion, like back back. It like jumped back into. So. My question is, one, was it the LCS saying slow down? And how come it didn't tell the lady <laughs> that hit the little boy, you know, to, to slow down? Two, like, is it possible for me to see the world in slow motion whenever I want like that? Three is, um, can I just go around lifting cars whenever I want? <laughs> and... Uh, and and lastly, uh, does does uh, do you if you if you hack the system, if you're you know doing things out of the break the rule set, does that go against your like points or does that hurt your score? <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. This is a virtual reality, and in virtual reality, all sorts of things are possible, even lifting cars and. Slowing time, all that is an easy thing to do inside of virtual reality. But it needs to be done in a way that it's not obvious to anybody that something extraordinary happened. Okay. So, or at least not obvious to many people. It could be obvious to a few people, but not obvious to the crowd. Okay. Well, in that case, you were, when you went into slow motion, you also weren't really thinking with your intellect about what it was that you were doing. I mean, you didn't tell me this, but you know, I'm telling you that. You know, you weren't really thinking about what you were doing. You were in intuitive space where you were just doing what you knew what it was you were supposed to do without your intellect being connected to it. And in that space, the slowdown of time was because of your focus. You weren't focusing on anything else but what it was you had to do. The rest of it you were letting go. So it's almost like when you go into a meditation state, you let go of your sense data. You were basically letting go of your sense data because you were focused. And this wasn't all your choice at all. It was just your role to play in that instance because you were there to play that that role. So then you go and you you know, pick up the boy, the the car, and the boy gets taken out. And you didn't tell us whether or not the boy was all right or not, but I assumed he, he, uh, he died. He died. He didn't make it. Okay. I mean, I, he, he was, it was bad. Yeah. So anyway, you did what you did, and uh, that was not so much a choice as a role that was put on you. You know, cast on you that you were to act that way in that role, which then informs the answer to the last question: Is can you do that whenever you want? And the answer to that's yes and no. No, in the sense that if you just tried to do it like tomorrow or the next day, it probably wouldn't work out too well, because it wasn't something that you did; it was something that happened to you. There's a difference. The causality there was beyond you. It wasn't just your intent that was doing that. 
But can that sort of thing be done and can one learn to be able to do that more when they need to? Yes, that is possible, but it takes a lot of practice and you have to be able to live at the, in the intuitive space, let go of the intellectual space, let go of the physical space and uh, work within the constraints of the uncertainty that was there in that situation which means had there been a whole bunch of people standing on the street corners, if this was a busy downtown area and there were lots of, of pedestrians, probably wouldn't have happened. There wouldn't have been enough uncertainty for the system to work that with you. So it also requires kind of a special situation. So you just can't do it anytime, anywhere. But you may, if you train your intuitive side, do it some of the time when appropriate. Can you explain that uncertainty part again, please? The system does not want to do something that seems you know, too magical or um, violates the rule sets in a big way. It can do that in a small way with a few people, kind of a, more of a private situation, but in a public situation, it doesn't want to break the rules. What that does is, you know, the virtual reality is a good virtual reality if you don't know it's a virtual reality. If you know it's a virtual reality, then it's not a very good virtual reality. To be a really good one, you can't tell the difference between the virtual reality and, and, a, and a material reality. That's how good it needs to be. So it doesn't want to be a bad virtual reality. It doesn't want these things to be known too much. It wants it all to be according to the rule set. But in special circumstances like this, it can violate the rule set, but it can only do it if there's enough uncertainty in the fact that there was a violation. So if there were a lot of people standing around, then having a guy walk around and pick up a car like it didn't weigh much isn't so likely to happen. That's going to happen when there's nobody else around or when there aren't many people around. And it depends again on the system and how, uh, how hard the system was trying to get a particular result. At, at the time, um, well this was like, God, I was like 20 years old, so this was like 20 years ago. and. Uh, I just remember, I mean, there was no cell phones with cameras or like, it's not like anyone was recording. And there was probably like just the lady that, that, that hit the boy, mm -hmm. the guy that grabbed the boy, and then like maybe, oh, the little, the little boy's brother, little brother was standing mm -hmm. there crying. But I remember, you know, just a few people, but it was, it was a busy street and cars were still driving by, but I just, I, I just remember that feeling of, but you're right, like I wasn't thinking at all. It right. was kind of like I was just in autopilot and then, as soon as I dropped the car, I remember just everything coming back into like right. you were fast. done. Like it right. felt really fast, and I was like, "Whoa!" Now it's like this is what reality is. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it can happen within small groups of people. Things that are uncertain. You know, when when you're just driving by and you get a glimpse, it's easy to convince yourself that no, that's what I thought I saw, but it must not have been that. You know, it must have been something else. Uh, plausible deniability. That's what's, that's what's required. Hi, Tom. Thanks for coming here. Um, so I have, I'm going to use the White House correspondence trick and ask you two questions. Everyone seems to be doing multi-part questions, but I'll help you by repeating them. Can you read, talk, the talk up a little bit? Sure. Um, so my first question is, the system obviously knows what evolution is. It, it's, it's scoring the system, and it seems to know what progression is. And we're, we're trying to, to play that game and, and move up that scale or play this ascension game or whatever it is. Um, so if the idea is to lower entropy and reduce fear, become love, what 
if you could maybe describe that a little bit better, like what does that look like? How does the system really, really grade that? Because I can imagine someone um, becoming nearly perfect at that. And is there, do they, um, are there other planes? Do they ascend up and maybe become like a big cheese? Do they, do we evolve out of being an IOUC into something bigger? Do we combine? Is there some type of evolution where we're not just individuated anymore? We, we, you know, I think about evolution. I think about oh, you it became a great, almost a perfect cell. Now I'm ready to join other cells and become something more organized, like a, mm. you know, a little organelle or an organ or yeah. something like that. Okay, well I'll address that. For the most part, and for, for most of us, as we evolve, we'll go through a couple of stages. At first, it's mostly about us working on our fear. It's kind of self-focused in that way, um, about getting rid of fear, becoming love. Then, it's more about being helpful to others. Being helpful to just the people that are around you. In other words, being a teacher. And then after that, it's being a teacher at a higher level, like with lots of people, not just the people around you. And part of being a teacher is just being a good example. You know, that's part of being a teacher, an important part. So when you evolve, and let's say you go through all those steps and you get to a point where you're a, a teacher and you have, have grown up a lot, that means you have, have little ego, little fear, and lots of love. When you have lots of love, it's about other. It's not about yourself. And when it's about other, what you want to do next is go to wherever the most help is needed, because that's where you can maximize your contribution. So it's not like you want to go someplace where you can sit down and relax because you've been working hard, you know, for the last 20 centuries and now you just want to kick back and enjoy life, learn to play a harp, sit on a cloud, you know, kind of goof off for a while, you know. That's, that's not a low entropy choice. It's a high entropy choice. That's a very self-centered choice. So what you want to do is to go to where you're needed most. And where that is, for most of us, will be back here. Because there are a lot of people yet to grow up. And there's a need for a lot of teachers and a lot of good examples. That would be very helpful. So, and the reason it would be back here is because you already know how this game works. Once you're real familiar with a, with a uh, VR game that you've been playing, it's so much easier to play that game than it is to take a seat in one that you've never played before. It just has a pretty long learning curve. So you can be immediately more helpful if you come back here. So that's what mostly happens. Is it possible that you do something else? Yes, it's possible. You can go some other virtual reality where help is needed, maybe even critically. You could, uh, you know, other than this, physical universe, some other physical universe someplace. Or you could, uh, you know, take a job as a big cheese perhaps if the position was open, if you had grown up enough. But that would be a lot of growing. So that would, that would mean you'd have to keep an awful lot of things in your mind at once. And you'd have to be very grown up to do it. But yes, you can do those other things. But mostly what we do is we come back here and try to be useful, try to be helpful. So the, the management positions, I'm not aspiring to one of those, by the way, but are they the same type of being as us, like IOUC? Or? Yeah, okay. they're basically the same type of being us. They've just grown up more than we have. Okay, and then my second question really was about honesty. like. Um, understanding that <clears throat> the entire communication network here is based on information and then interpretation and all of that stuff. Um, 
how honest is the system in communicating with us? I've heard sometimes you've given me the impression that the system is giving us what we need, whether or not that's really objectively true or not. And, and we tend, as humans, to interpret it as truth. Mm -hmm. um, but then you start looking around and you see all the metaphors that everyone else is getting, and it's like, well, maybe somewhere underneath all the symbolism, the, the truth is basically the same, but the interpretations are wildly different. And I, I hope that makes sense, but I'm wondering if you could talk about how yeah. it values or defines yeah, it truth. is true that the system can sometimes give you misinformation purposely. That does happen. But it only happens when you need that misinformation to grow, when the system calculates that that is in your best interest. Um, a good example of that would be uh, some people will kind of initially develop their intuitive side to the point that they're fairly good at looking at future probability. Okay? And they're fairly good at, at uh, getting into that theta state and getting guidance and information, what would be a good thing to do in this case and a good thing to do in that case. If they get carried away with that to where basically they give up their free will and depend on something else to make all their choices for them, that's when the system will give them some misinformation that leads them into a, you know, a brick wall. And that's just saying, you know, don't rely on us. You have to make your own choices. So that's a situation. Another is that if there's something that uh, you're particularly uh, have your ego wrapped around, sometimes the system will give you a, you know, a nice loving slap to let you know that that is not profitable and it's not a good idea and you need to rethink that. Yeah, it's like sometimes people say, you know, be real careful what you say, you know, if you complain about something because that raises the probability that you're going to have to deal with that later, you know, in some other way. You're going to have to experience that from the, from the painful side of it. So there's some truth to that. So the system will do what it calculates is gives you the highest probability of growing up. And sometimes that requires misinformation. Sometimes that requires no information. If you are getting data out of databases and you abuse that ability, use it for the wrong reasons, uh, get puffed up over it, the system will just stop or give you misinformation to bring your ego down a bit, you know. Usually at, right at a time when it's most important that you get it right, you know, when you've called in all the cameras to witness your magnificence, that's when it all fails, you see. Yeah, right, so that's, you know, that happens. So that's the first question. Um, was there part unanswered? I think you answered all of it, but I was just going to say, I think we need to, Cusack needs to befriend like one billionaire, like <laughs> maybe like Elon Musk, and then we can just buy all this yeah. equipment and he's Well, we're, <laughs> we are accepting applications. <laughs> if you happen to be a billionaire, then we encourage you to apply. <laughs> okay, who's next? I think I'm next. Uh, okay. So this kind of follows up on your question, um, in a way. Um, I'm fairly new to your work, although I'm extremely grateful for um, tying a lot of my life together. And um, the, uh, I'm, my daughter brought me. I came for her. So. Um, my question is, in your experience with out-of-body work, mm -hmm. it, um, as you said, you, it's brought you to a sense of a greater reality. And, um, and I'm experiencing how that, right in, in this today, I'm, a, I'm getting a firsthand experience of how that has 
um, evolved you, even though I read it. It's more prevalent right now. And um, I've recently run into a body of work in the area of hypnosis. Um, it's been around for a long time. Just coincidentally, I just ran across it. And um, it's in the area, area of uh, not just past life regression, but regression to life between lives, also called LBL work. Mm -hmm. So, um, and coincidentally, I was watching, I pulled up a video, and on the same YouTube page was Michael Newton and yourself with the same title by, by coincidence. Um, but I have a, so I have a question about out of the out of body work, the out of body experience that you talk about and what can be experienced in hypnosis in the, because he, he uses the theta state mm -hmm. in three and four hour sessions and how that can either support our process. You did kind of address when you talked to this gentleman about how if it's going to support us, it, the LCS will support us or, or not, depending on when we, what we need. And I believe that would be apparent in hypnotherapy session as well. Um, but I'm interested in what you would have to say about hyp hypnosis versus the kind of yeah. what you, meditative, because I've experienced deep meditation, but if I go too far, I just fall asleep. So I'm just, okay. okay. The question is, a, is comparison, comparing and discussing the difference between hypnosis and meditation. Okay. The primary difference is that in hypnosis, you basically give up your free will to the hypnotist. So the hypnotist is the one asking the questions. The hypnotist is leading the process in an out of body or in a, in a meditation state. You lead the process yourself. That's the primary difference. Both have similar, you know, take you to similar uh, intuitive states. They just do it by different means. You know, in the hypnosis, you uh, gradually let go of your sense data to where you're no longer really aware of what's going on around you. You're just kind of a mind, a memory, and that's all. Um, you're aware pretty much only of the hypnotist's voice. You're aware of that very clearly. And then you execute his choices. In the out of body, you know, there's hundreds of different processes for getting out of body, but it just boils down to something very simple as you just attach to a different data stream. You have a, this data stream which you interpret this data in this you know, VR that we call the physical universe, and you just drop this and do something else. That means the same thing. You let go of the sense data here. You're no longer processing sense data and you start processing a different data stream. So that's about all it is. And when you're in hypnosis, you're not thinking, you're in that alone space. It's very much like a meditation state, but it's the hypnotist that's giving you suggestions and you are following those. And the first suggestions he gives you is to relax, to let go, you know, don't hear anything but my voice, you know, let everything else, so he's basically leading you to a state of point consciousness, which is the same thing you get to after you practice meditation. So there's a lot of similarities to it. The biggest point is that in the out of body you have your own, you make your own questions. You decide to do what it is you're going to do. So that's more of a exploration. Oh, let's go explore that. No, let's go explore that. You get to choose what you're going to do, what the subject is, the kind of information you want, how you go about it, and you can modify it and change it and embellish it any way you want. With a hypnotist, he's got a plan, and he's got a certain goals to get to certain kinds of information, and you follow that plan. So it's more rigid and more directed 
the outer body is kind of a free-for-all. You can do whatever you like. So that's the main difference between the two. Is it uh, the, the kind of hypnosis I'm thinking about would be where I create the questions of what I want to explore and have somebody take me into theta yeah, have state. Somebody, to, have somebody to, else lead you there. Yeah, is that yeah. the same thing? Is what yeah, you, but that's your, yeah, so you make some of the choices. You, you outline where it is you want to go mm -hmm. and what you want to do, but then the hypnotist takes over and actually asks the questions and guides you there. So better to just, so in terms of my evolution or mm -hmm. my, then it, well, I Am I learning more would, doing it on my own? Yeah, obviously. it would be better yeah. to just do it on your own. Then you don't need a hypnotist as part of the process, which means you don't have to schedule with a hypnotist. You don't have to pay a hypnotist. You just don't need a hypnotist. You can do it just as well without them. But you have to probably practice more. See, if you don't practice, you never meditate, you don't do any of that stuff, then a hypnotist will work for you because he does all the work, basically. All you do is follow the directions. But if you do it yourself, you probably need a little more skill and a little more practice to do it yourself. So it's probably easier to let somebody else do it for you. But it's much better to do it yourself because what happens is that you'll get involved in something and that will trigger something else, which triggers something else. And often you'll end up in some place you never would have thought about that is really profoundly, you know, valuable to you, but you never would have thought about it ahead of time, so it wouldn't have been on your map of where you were going. And that happens more often than not. It's the, it, that's the rule, more than the, than the exception, that when you're in outer body, this leads you to that, leads you to something else, and often the first few things are kind of trivial. And then, boom, you know, you get into the thing that really is meaningful to you. Whereas if you have to make that map ahead of time, you're very limited you don't have the ability to, to jump around. And you can also be in that and say, well, this hasn't been very productive. Let me try something else, which you don't have with that. It's just more flexible. So it's a little, a little harder to do, perhaps. It requires more discipline and more practice, but it's more flexible. And I think you'll get more value out of it in that you'll be freer to follow your intuition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. <clears throat> all right, so um, I've had like 20 questions through my head, and, uh, and they're all on 20 different topics. So I'm going to try to pick uh, one for me that I think will be interesting for myself and my wife, and perhaps other people in the audience. Um, my wife happens to be an endocrinologist, so she deals with blood sugars and diabetes very often. Um, I know uh, from listening to some of your lectures online uh, a little bit about, about how you feel about sugar, um, but I, I'm really kind of curious because when I try to communicate with my wife without her level of education and how she sees um, you know, the science of how sugar and insulin work uh, within the body, um, I, I come across as you know, maybe somebody, you know how they, the joke is, like, don't ask a vegan, or don't talk about veganism or something, right, mm -hmm. unless you're asked about it. Well, it's, it's kind of like if I start bringing up sugar, I'm just... I don't even know what I'm saying, right? Um, so what I want to ask is, can you, can you share your thoughts on sugar, how it affects the body, and if you can, like, how does that play into diabetes? Where do you think that's going? Um, do you think there's a cure? Things like that. Okay, sure. Sugar, um, I found just by experiment. This wasn't any theory, didn't take me there. What took me there was my own experience. And when I was at the lab with Bob Monroe, I noticed that some days were just better than other days. Sometimes things worked really quickly and easily, and sometimes it was a struggle to stay stable, to stay connected. My mind seemed to want to wander more. So I wondered what the difference was. And I figured it was a good shot that it was dietary, that it was something I was taking into my system because I was generally a very stable person, emotionally, physically, you know, everything was pretty stable. A lot of exercise, no illnesses, hardly ever got sick. So the things to move around like that, I figured was probably something that I was eating. And I tried all sorts of things to eliminate, to add back over probably a couple of years. 
and found out that sugar was one of the main culprits. Also preservatives, also artificial colors and artificial flavors. Those were the things that were seen to be the most potent. Also caffeine. Um, and what I discovered about sugar was that it would cloud my mind. If I ate sugar, that for the next four hours or so, about four hours, my mind would be like, I don't know, you're all old enough, but in the old days, all of the um, medicines that you took, antihistamines to keep you from sneezing and whatever, they also would make you drowsy. They'd make your mind kind of, you know, like you were, it turned you into a zombie, basically. You could just kind of sit and stare at a wall and that'd be fine. You know, you just, uh, you know, you didn't feel like active, you weren't too, you know, in there. You, it just turned you into a, a mental zombie. And that's what the sugar did. So I started not eating any sugar. And I found when, that, when it really was not any, it worked. It's not that you cut down on sugar, but didn't eat any sugar. No honey, no molasses, nothing that is, that is uh, uh, sweet. No artificial sweeteners either. Just get rid of the sweeteners. That worked well. Okay, that was a pretty broad category though. I swept through a lot of things that way. But that worked and I found without the sugar, my mind stayed clearer more consistently. I didn't have the periods of fog. And I had already been working in the lab for probably a year to two years before I started this. So my awareness of my state of consciousness, my awareness of my consciousness was pretty finely honed by then. I'd been working in a lab with meditation and going to altered states and doing things there and coming back and going and coming and going and being in and out of states. And exactly what my mind felt like was real clear to me. Whereas if you haven't done that, the state of your consciousness is like, huh? State of a consciousness, what's that? You know, you don't really relate to that. But I did relate to it and I could tell. So I, I stopped the sugar altogether and I found a couple of interesting things that happened. Not only did my mind clear, but my ability to hold focus and my ability to uh, lower noise were both enhanced dramatically. I also found out that if I took some sugar after a while, and I found it was addictive because getting rid of sugar, the first two or three weeks of that weren't easy. Like any addict, you'd find yourself making excuses why just a little sugar wouldn't hurt, you know. Oh yes, this looks good, I'll buy some of those. They probably don't have any sugar in them, you know, and of course they do. But that's the way addicts act with their dope, you know, that they're trying not to be addicts. They find all kinds of reasons why they can just get a little hit anyway. So I realized that, that it was a physical addiction. And then I realized that when I took sugar, after I'd been off of it now, I was clear of sugar for a, a fairly long time. And if I would get some by accident, first thing that would happen was my gums would ache. And this would probably be in the first three or four seconds after putting it in my mouth. My gums around my teeth would all just ache. Then about 30 seconds to a minute after that, I'd have a headache. And then the, the, the fog would come in and I'd be foggy kind of in that order, and the fog would last for about four hours before you get rid of the fog. Then I discovered through trial and error, I did trial and error on all these things. I didn't just come to the conclusion, oh, it's sugar, whatever. I tried different kinds of sugar. Well, what if this, you know, sugar addicts don't want to give up their dope too easily. So it's like, well, maybe this kind of sugar would be all right. And I happened to find that barley malt was then an exception that I could take in very small amounts. If I didn't take much barley malt, I didn't get a reaction. Gums didn't hurt, didn't get the headache, didn't get fuzzy. If I took a lot of barley malt, a lot being like a whole teaspoonful, that'd be a lot. Like a whole barley malt candy would be too much. But a little bit didn't have the reaction, or even a tiny bit of sugar would have a reaction. 
In fact, the sugar, I got sensitive to it, that if I walked into a bakery, just breathing the air would give me a headache almost immediately, just from the sugar that was in the air. Just because of all the donuts and things that were on the shelves, it was that much sugar vapor in the air. And I was forever, when you tell people, well, I don't eat sugar, and they'd say, oh, well, then this is fine. It has just a little bit of sugar in it. You know, and they didn't understand it. Even just a little bit was a problem that I could detect because I was very aware of what my consciousness felt like. So I came up with kind of a theory that is just a theory, it has no research to back it up, has nothing but my own experience. And the theory is that sugar is a very important part of your metabolism and where your body works. It's kind of almost the the coin of the realm, if you will. Glucose is important everywhere, and particularly in the brain. It's got a lot of things that depend on glucose. So I noticed that barley malt was very slow to digest. Because I also noted that if I ate an apple, it didn't have a problem, because the sugar was tied up in the fiber of the apple. If I ate three apples, I'd get a problem. Too much sugar. But if I just eat an apple, and I didn't eat it in 30 seconds, but I'd eat it over some time, that it hit my system slowly and I didn't seem to have the same reaction. So my theory was that the problem for the, the fog in your brain is that the glucose levels were unstable. I noticed you eat and it took four hours for it to, to go away. Actually, it took more like six or seven hours to go away completely, but to the point to where the headache and, the, and most of the symptoms were gone was about four hours. Well, four hours is about the distance we have between meals. And most everybody in our culture has sugar with every meal and sugar between meals. So what sugar was doing, the glucose levels would go up and then they start going back down and then they go up and then they go back down and then you have another meal and they go up and they go back down and your glucose levels are doing this all day long. You know, a little candy bar for the snack in the middle of the day and so on. So glucose is just unstable. And here you've got a brain, okay, that is, that is um, constrained by what the avatar can do. The brain itself doesn't remember anything, doesn't process anything, doesn't, you know, do anything. It's just a virtual brain. But the brain, the rule set that evolved the brain, sets the limits on what the consciousness can do with that avatar. Okay, so that's the connection between the brain and the, and the consciousness in a virtual reality. So I thought that the imbalance in sugar, the fact it was fluctuating all the time, and of course every time it fluctuates in your body, your pancreas will squirt in a little insulin, oh, it starts to bring it down, but then it tends to overshoot, and then it brings it back up, and by then the next candy bar is hit, you know, and then it flies away. And it's just this thing. And it takes a long time for that system to damp out. Now, at the same time, Pamela was having also uh, issues with sugar. And those issues, as I plotted them on a chart over a year or two, you know, the symptoms versus the time after ingesting the sugar, and I found those would last for as long as three weeks two weeks, three week cycle before, uh, before those would damp out all the way. I mean, you had the big stuff, but then you had this little stuff in there that was still detectable out for about several weeks. And I thought, wow, that's amazing because you'd think the biology would be all balanced out a lot quicker than that. But it seemed to take a longer time. And I think that's because other mechanisms were involved. The sugar was also interacting with things like serotonin production and other endocrine systems. They weren't, they weren't removed from the sugar, and those things start moving around and get out of balance because the sugar's out of balance, then you've got stuff that takes a longer time to settle down. It's not quite just about sugar. So that was, the, that was my theory, that it was the instability of the glucose in the body that created the fog that I found when I took the sugar. Now, if you take sugar all the time, fog becomes normal. You live in a fog, you know, 
you're always foggy because you're always eating and always has sugar in it. It's hard to avoid sugar, very hard. And if just a tiny little bit affects you, then you're going to be fogged all the time. So you wake up in the morning and maybe you're a little different, but by the time you hit breakfast, breakfast is a lot of sugar. Uh, that starts it going for the whole day. And you're foggy all day, but you don't think, oh, I'm foggy. You just think it's a normal day because you've always been foggy. You've been a sugar addict since you were two years old and grandma shoved that cupcake into your mouth, you know, on your birthday. So most people don't notice. And I've had probably two or three dozen people who also have gotten off sugar. And I've asked them about their experience. And for the most part, their experience and my experience were very close. They had a similar kind of thing. Their sensitivity began to grow because they're more aware of what it felt like when you were in a, you know, had, had the sugar changing your, your, your consciousness state. And they also found that the headaches and the gum aches, and they found that uh, they were clearer and stayed much clearer. And then they suddenly realized, oh, I've been in that fog you know, all my life. This clearness is me. This is really me, you know, not the stupor that I'm in when I'm you know, a sugar stupor all the time. And that was a big eye opener. And the way you, you realize it, you don't realize it at first because it's so slow going off. But then when those accidents happen and you eat some sugar accidentally where something you think doesn't have it does, and suddenly the fog comes on you in about a five, 10 second period, you go from clear to foggy, it's really, really noticeable. It's not subtle then. As you go off sugar, it's pretty subtle. But when you get that accidental hit, that really lets you know that I used to be like that all the time. And that's not a comfortable feeling. So that's the thing about sugar. If you, in, in doing what we do, if you're going to explore your intuitive states, that's what we're doing here. We're exploring our intuition, our intuitive states. We develop our intellectual states. We start going to school and we, all of our lives, we're learning about the logic and the process of doing intellectual things. Our intuitive side, we ignore, and we never develop that. That just sits there. But if you do develop it, it can be just as sensitive, just as reliable, and even more significant than the intellectual side. And that's another whole conversation if you and, want to have and that. Tom, really quick, with, re with regards to children and raising children, okay. um, we have a lot of conversation about sugar and how much sugar our son is having mm -hmm. and what he's eating. Um, really quickly, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I can have a, quite a bit of experience on that. My children did not eat sugar. Um, the only time they got sugar was when they got old enough to go to school and swap lunch boxes or they got invited to other kids' houses to stay. And then they did. And they brought their friends over to our house to stay sometimes for sleepovers. And whenever my kids went to somebody else's house, I got reports about how calm, how focused, how easy they were. And whenever their friends came over to our house, it was like, when is he going to go home? <laughs> Kids were wild, you know, they were crazy. They're bouncing off the walls. They were completely, um, I don't know, high is a good word. You know, they were high and they were just frantic. And they were also prone to uh, crying fits, suddenly, you know, getting upset. Um, they were a lot more cantankerous, a lot less social, more self-centered. So it was, uh, you know, and that was, that was just once or twice, but just typically. And it's not, I, I don't believe that our children just made friends with, you know, people who were, you know, high, high stressed. It was just normal. Those are the way normal kids tend to be. So my children were very relaxed and much more, uh, I don't know, I guess people would say that they were very, adult-like in a sense, that they weren't rowdy and crazy and running around. I remember once having to sit and wait for a table in a restaurant where we were meeting somebody and we had to wait for like two hours for a table. And I had three children then and they were like, you know, three, four and 
five or maybe three, four, and six, and we all sat quietly for hours. And people would come up to us and say, are those children real? <laughs> Where did you get, what have you done to them? You know, uh, please tell me. Uh, so anyway, it uh, makes a big difference in the kids. Sure, they don't need as much you know, sugar to make them crazy as, as we do. But they get used to it and they get addicted. And most everybody in our culture is a sugar addict. And because of that, people who sell food know that it'll sell better if you put a little sugar in it because you have all these sugar addicts. And even though it's not enough to taste, it doesn't taste sweet so much, the body knows it's getting a little hit of its favorite dope and it just likes that better. So they'll have out a whole bunch of french fries and some of these french fries will have just a little bit of sugar in them and the people who taste test that say, ah, these are the ones we like best, I don't know why I like them best, there's just something about them that is better. Well, those are the ones with sugar in them. That's why hamburger meat and french fries and you know, everything you can think of has sugar in it because it sells better because we have a nation of, of sugar addicts that will buy things that have sugar in them and instead of buying things that don't have sugar in them. Lots of that. Matter of fact, I, I tried a, the other day um, a, a Beyond Burger <laughs> because it had no meat in it. I'm a vegan mostly. And so I tried uh, this Beyond Burger and it was sweet. I said, what is this? And sure enough, there's sugar in the recipe. And that's because they were trying to emulate real hamburger meat. And if you want your product to taste, feel, and look like real hamburger meat, sugar is required. Anyway, that's the sugar story. Can you say, while you're on that topic, a little bit about booze? Booze. Alcohol. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, alcohol <laughs> is another thing that goes in there with the, uh, you know, the nicotine and the caffeine. Those are all psychotropic substances that modify your consciousness, your awareness. They're awareness modifiers. And all of that stuff just gets in the way. And you know, again, when you get off something, if you've been an addict and you're no longer an addict, you tend to get real sensitive to the stuff that you were addicted to. So at that point, you know, I could take, you know, you get a tiny little bit of any of these things, of sugar or, or caffeine or something, and boy, it would just ball you over because the sensitivity tend to grow. But then that would lessen with time. But at least I found that, and most people do too. So alcohol is just another problem. It uh, interferes with your ability to focus and, and clear and to create a low, a low noise intent, a high quality intent. It keeps your mind scrambled and fuzzy, which is why people take it. They want their mind to be scrambled and fuzzy. Most of the psychotropics that people take are self-medication because they have stress that they don't want to deal with, and it's a way of dealing with it, is to basically drug yourself. So that's it, and our culture is full of it. Our culture is a drug culture. It really is. We talk, you know, we don't think of ourselves that way, but, you know, think about how we celebrate anything that happens. You got fired? Oh, no, let's go get a beer. You got a promotion? Yay, let's go get a beer. You know, what is it? You had a baby, and if it was a boy, you'd smoke a cigar, right? As a girl, you'd eat pastries or donuts or something. And every little item, you know, that happens in our life, the way that you deal with that item is to go take a drug. You know, get up in the morning, where's my drug? You know, I need my sugar, I need my caffeine, you know, and so on. It goes that way. We use drugs for every event. If you go to the football game or you go over to a neighbor's house, all watch football in a game, you take drugs while you're there. Drugs are, our culture can hardly do anything social without drugs. You go out for an evening, you go want to dance or something, drugs. People are, you know, smoking dope. Tobacco is dope. Smoking dope. Smoking, uh, you know, other kinds of dope. Drinking. 
caffeine, whatever. They can get by with sugar. So it's, a, it's part of our culture. It's what we, it's what we do. I have a question about um, the vibrations experience. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, 10 out of 10 times, I would just freak out and run away. Over time, you know, it's gotten down to four out of five. I get out, it's fine, or have an experience. But I still get um, often one following the other one day, one night, It'll be no fear, I'm out. The very next day or two days later, I'm going to bed just completely relaxed and I'll get the gripping. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the metaphor I use is I'm being sucked into a black hole and torn apart to a million pieces and I just cannot tolerate it. And I'm terrified. It's mm -hmm. 3 a.m. in the dark and no matter how much curling up and love and acceptance, I don't, I love some Number one, did you have that even after you were getting out and you knew there was this other experience possible, did you still have the vibrations at time that, that would scare you? Yeah. And did you reach a point of getting over that? Or yeah. No, I never really got um, afraid of the vibrations. I, uh, I was startled by them at first when they first happened because they could get very violent. You know, and, I felt like a flag blowing in the wind, you know, it was just like rubber and you were oscillating like this at four hertz. And it got to the point that it was violent enough to be uncomfortable. But it may just have been my, my makeup, but I generally when that kind of thing happened, I just said, well, let's see where this goes. And I didn't get a, have a fear reaction to it. And eventually that went away. Before it went away, I associated that vibration with a good theta state. When I felt that vibration, I knew I was in a good theta state. So I liked it. It was a, it was a signpost. And I just let that vibration just sit there in the background, just, just hum while I was doing all the things that I was doing because it was a, a good sign that I was where I was supposed to be as far as altered state went. So then it was a, it was a friend rather than, than a you know, problem. But eventually it just went away. And I don't notice it now unless I want to. If I want to notice it, there it is. But if I don't notice it, I don't, you know, it's just not there all the time because I just don't pay any attention to it. I guess I'm so used to it that it's disappeared into the background. So what happens is sometimes you're fearful and sometimes you're not. That has to do with several things. One, it's mostly you. You know, it's not, the, it's not the, the meditation you're doing or the fact that sometimes the, the, you know, the monsters are out and sometimes they're all preoccupied scaring somebody else. You know, it's, it's mostly you, what you bring to the table with it. Sometimes you feel confident and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you feel more with it and together and kind of power and other times you don't. And I would say, look at your diet for that. There you may find a dietary connection between times that you feel one way and another way. Our, our central nervous system is this hugely complex bio, you know, biochemical thing that is very sensitive in all of its balances and interactions. And everybody's different, but a lot of times you can just get that central nervous system uh, a little out of whack and it makes you prone to things like anxiety. Yeah, the doctrine system, central nervous system. That is, our biology is pretty complicated. But you might find a food that you know, goes with that. Otherwise, it's just the way you, sometimes you feel stronger, sometimes you don't. So the times that you get to the fear, just go with it. Say, all right, I'm going to tear apart a whole bunch of little pieces. I wonder what that'll be like. Maybe my little pieces will be able to talk to each other. Let's find out. You know, that kind of an attitude. You need to just go with it. Nothing's going to hurt you. When it's all said and done, you're going to wake up, and you're going to be lying in your bed. 
So if you take a very casual attitude toward it, that's the best thing to do. It's easy to say, though. It's a little harder to actually do. Hi, Tom. Uh, so one question I have is about um, the health uh, issues um, and how, you know, you in some of your seminars you heal people and you can uh, see things that are wrong with people. Do you see um, a time when that will be more acceptable? I, I know you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you, the system doesn't want to make things obvious for the crowd, but if it's if it's more accepted, would it would there be a time when, you know, modern physicians would use, you know, sure. these type of techniques? Absolutely, it will. That will be a, you know acceptable practice, someday. Not right now. They don't do that. But you can find a lot of of um, you know, alternative medicine, MDs. You know, people also are MDs, but they're also aware of of uh, the body as being not just an intellect and a, and, a, and a biological machine. And they take their uh, attitude very seriously. You know, they take their time with their patients. They don't rush people through and to treat them like a hunk of meat on a conveyor belt that they are you know, dealing with as it passes by. And the, their interaction with the, with the patient is something that is an important part of their medicine. Well, that's what we're talking about. You know, it's that intention. They have a positive intent toward that. It's not like, yeah, I don't want to be here either, but you know, next. You know, that kind of an attitude, doctors that have that attitude, their patients don't do as well. They're not as good at healing. Doctors that really care about their patients are much better at healing. So it's there already. It's just not advertised very much. But so you can heal most anything on yourself or on other people. It's, you know, it's incredible what actually you can do it, but sometimes you can't, and there's reasons for that. It's not, it's not a, you know, the intuitive side is not like the intellectual side. The intellectual side, here's an algorithm, if this, then that, if that, then this other thing, you're done, and you always flow through that same logic, and that's the way it works. That's the objective intellectual side. On the intuitive side, it's a lot messier than that. You know, is your intention you know, noise free? Is your, in, you know, is your intention have enough intensity? There's all these other kind of squishy variables in there that make a big difference. So it's not, the, it's not as reliable. And then you have the thing that some people should not be healed. Sometimes the illness is part of the growth. Illness can be a, a, a growing experience as well. And in those kinds of situations, you try to heal them and the illness just reasserts itself back again because that's not a good candidate for healing. That illness is part of the path that they're on, part of an experience that they have to experience, and it's not to be taken away from them. So there's a lot more, a lot more variables in the intuitive side. Hi, Tom. First of all, I just got through the Trilogy audiobook. Thank you for reading all of your written words. Holy cow, that must have been quite the project. My question is, while you were exploring these reality frames, the IOC, AOM, was there ever a period where you were taken behind the scenes, and the best analogy I can use is, were you ever shown the source code or is all of this a territory that you have mapped out over the decades by, thing you, by things that you have observed, like somebody that's a cartographer? It's the latter, not the former. All of uh, my book was written because I figured it out by my own experiments, my own testing and trying. That's why it took so long. You know, I was worked on that for like 35 years before I started writing, and then it took me five years to write it because I had to figure it all out. And the only way to figure it out wasn't just to make up something that sounded good. You had to go test it and see, does this work this way? Is this variable you know, important to that outcome? 
And you just have to repeat things over and over and you have to be consistent. So it takes a long time to work through all the variables that are in the intuitive side to find out how it works. The system doesn't just give you answers. It doesn't do that. You know, you could ask the system, hey, tell me, you know, how does this thing work too? Better yet, automatic writing, write the book for me, you know? <laughs> I'll supply the paper and the ink, you know, you write the book. Or channel it, you know, you can do those things. But if you do, it's not yours. You don't own it. And if you don't own it, you can't explain it. And if you can't explain it, you have no credibility. So if you're gonna make a difference, you have to have credibility. The things you say, you have to be able to explain, why is it like that? And what are the parameters? So when he told me about his experience over there and about the car, and I said, yeah, but you weren't thinking. You were just in a, you were just in a, you know, a haze. You were doing what you had to do, but you weren't really there with your intellect. It was just a process that you were a part of. And he didn't tell me that, but I knew that because I understand you know, what he was doing and how it works. So you don't, you don't have credibility if it's not built on your own experience. It's just not useful. There's lots of people with lots of opinions, but there's not many that actually can give you real answers that are logical. That's the difference. If you really do it yourself, then you, you can explain it. And one of the things I tried to do is make my books an on-ramp for the left brain. You know, because the right brainers have all, you know, a whole bookshelf full of books in the philosophy, in the new age, in, in you know, religion, all sorts of things that'll tell them about the non-physical and all sorts of things about it. And any of the left brain people, the people who rely on logical process, they get three pages in that and throw the book down and say, I can't use it. Prove it. This is just a bunch of assertions, you know, a bunch of, of opinions. Prove it, this doesn't make any sense. How do I know any of that's true? Just throw the book away. So right brainers have had lots of on-ramps to the big picture, to the larger system, to a bigger viewpoint. And all the left brainers are left standing in the dust saying, prove it, prove it. You guys are all stupid. You know, you're all silly, you're making this up. None of it exists. You're all airheads. You know? So they're stuck there. And the problem is that in our culture, all the movers and shakers, I shouldn't say all, but most of the movers and shakers, the people that set the trends, make the laws, you know, you know the doctors, the lawyers, the executives, the engineers, you know, all of these people tend to be left brain, logical process people. You know, the people that invent all the stuff here we're using, they're all left brain, logical process people, all the techies. Yeah, so they're all left behind in the dust. And that's not a good thing. We needed a way that was logical, that they could start at the beginning and logically work their, through, their way through it and come out at the other end with a bigger picture and not feel like they'd been tricked or it was just somebody's opinion. So that's really what the way I wrote my book was to, was to give an on-ramp to the left brainers because you know I was a left brainer. I'm a physicist. That's about as left brain as you can get. So I understood that. I just happened to be a physicist that worked for a decade with Bob Monroe, you know, half time for 20 hours a week. So I had another, I had some insights from the other side. But I have I had to figure it all out myself. That was a rule. Now it would help me figure it out, but it would never tell me what an answer was. It helped me to figure things out by sending me places in the larger conscious system to view things, to see things, how things worked. I spent a month or two months, several months, with a job in the, in the uh, virtual reality called the transition reality, like a Walmart greeter. You know, people just died, you know, they, they were, come on in, you know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, paper towels are over there. Yeah. It was, you know, just to see it and to be a part of it. And the thing was just my education. So I learned a lot, 
but I had to learn it on my own. But the system helped me by taking me places and showing me things that gave me more insight into how things worked. So in that way, I got a lot of help, but no answers. And generally, that's the way the system is. It's not going to give you any answers. It's not going to ever tell you what to do. If it's telling you what to do, it's, uh, you know, don't listen, because it's not the larger kinds of system. It will never tell you what to do. It'll give you some information to help you make a choice, but it doesn't ever tell you what to do. You have to always make your own choices.